The most impressive websites in the world all seem to follow a similar pattern. They use 3D animations to bring the application to life. For example, you cannot browse Bruno Simon's portfolio website. Instead, you can drive it. Yep, you heard that right. You navigate the website by driving a car that's interacting with the world by breaking the letters and crashing down walls. And let's look at Uni, which I think is a hippo, a smiling hippo that floats, changes colors, knocks people in the air, and then flies into the outer space with other hippos? I mean, you cannot make this up. This may look impossible, but in this video, you'll learn how to create your own 3D developer portfolio in React using 3JS. By the end of this video, you will have built and deployed a personal portfolio website that is so impressive, it is guaranteed to give you a job. And you might be shocked at how easy it really is once you understand a few concepts related to cameras, lighting, and geometry. This tutorial is beginner friendly and I'll assume you're completely new to 3JS. With modern, fully responsive design, captivating 3D models that are fully customizable, smooth and seamless animations providing a buttery feel to the user interactions, the ability to send emails through the website, and much more. This is the best 3JS developer portfolio that you can currently find on YouTube. Alongside building your own 3D web development portfolio, you'll also learn how to use 3JS, a powerful 3D graphics library for rendering and animating 3D models. React 3 Fiber, a popular library for creating 3D graphics with 3JS in React. Tailwind CSS, a popular utility-first CSS styling framework. Framer Motion, the most popular library used to bring your React website to life with animations. You'll also learn how to load, create, and customize stunning 3D models and geometries with various lights, as well as understand the 3D world with camera and positioning in the space. Make your code reusable and scalable using higher order components and other industry standard practices. You'll implement sending emails through a form on the website with email.js, and you'll ensure responsiveness across all devices and improve your site's performance using suspense and preload. We're going to start simple and then move to more complex concepts. I'll explain every step of the way. If this video reaches 20,000 likes, I'm recording a second 3JS video. We have recently added the free resources section to the jsmastery.pro website. The link is in the description. So from now on, alongside the professional project-based courses, such as Filmpire and NFT Marketplace, you can get entirely free guides and eBooks about React, Web3, and front-end, back-end, and full-stack development. Before you start building this into your own developer portfolio, allow me to give you a quick demo of everything you will build. First, we have a wonderful hero section with a title and a subtext. Then we have this wonderful looking 3D model that you can move around. We can scroll to the next section that allows us to see the introduction of who you are and what you do. After that, we can see a great work experience section where we can see where you worked and what did you do at those specific companies. After that, we have some balls right here that showcase the technology that you're passionate about and the technologies you know how to develop projects in. After that, we have the projects themselves. In this specific case, we're showcasing the projects from the JSM Masterclass experience. This person is definitely gonna get hired. After that, we can see the testimonials. What do other people have to say about you? Hopefully something nice. And finally, we have some stars going to the end of our portfolio with a great 3D background and a contact section with a moving 3D model. What more can you expect? And these have been all of the sections of our great 3D, Framer Motion, React, 3JS, 3JS Fiber portfolio website that you will create in this single video with my help. Hopefully you're excited. Before we start building out our project, let's first get the hosting and the domain name for our new site, 
your portfolio, or any website you'll create in the future. Hostinger is my personal recommendation. And right now, they're offering a crazy deal. Two bucks and 79 cents a month with a four-year plan, plus three months extra. So I simply needed to show this to you. The link with an extra discount is in the description. Let's click the claim deal button to see if it is really as good as it sounds. It seems like we're getting web hosting for about two and a half bucks and we can host 100 websites, also receive 100 gigabytes of SSD storage, unlimited SSL certificate, meaning that we have HTTPS security, we get a free domain and a free email. That is crazy. Hostinger also has a phenomenal customer support 24 seven, as you can see by all of the great ratings right here. We're going to create an entire 3D developer portfolio. So we want to have a custom domain name to be credible. For every industry standard application, such as the one you're building in this video, we need it to be fast, reliable, and trustworthy. And all of the features you're getting with this plan, such as a custom domain name, email, and speed, makes all the difference. Since I've partnered with Hostinger, they decided to give you an even bigger discount. You can find the link and a unique discount code in the description. Enjoy. Once you visit the link in the description, click Claim Deal and then Add to Cart. Here, we have to choose the period of our hosting. With the crazy discount going on right now, I'll definitely choose 48 months to save the most money. And down below, you can choose your payment method and then you can enter your coupon code. That is JavaScript Mastery, all caps. That's going to give you an even bigger discount. After you complete the purchase, you'll be redirected to the Hostinger's dashboard. I'll see you there. And we're back to the Hostinger's dashboard. As you can see, I'm personally using Hostinger for all of my company's websites. If you purchase the premium web hosting, you should be able to see this yellow setup button right here. So let's go ahead and set everything up before we begin with the development of our great project. That way, when you reach the end of the video, you will already have created your own domain name that you can deploy your great portfolio to. So let's go ahead and click set up. Start now. We are going to skip create an empty website for now. Right here, we have to choose the name of our website. So you can choose a domain amongst existing domains or you can buy a new one. In this case, I always recommend to go with something like name and then last name as that works best for the portfolio. So try to enter your first and last name and then you can proceed. If your first and last name is a bit more popular, you can always play with it and get something shorter or longer depending on what you prefer. In this case, I'm gonna proceed with one of the existing domains that I already have. Finally, you need to click finish setup. As you can see, Hostinger will immediately start initializing the setup for you and this process shouldn't last more than a minute. While our hosting is being set up, I just wanted to quickly let you know that there's a GitHub repository containing the entire code for this project. So if you ever get stuck, just make sure to visit the GitHub page and compare your code with the code that's on there. While you're here, I would appreciate it if you gave this repository a star. Also, our Discord channel is now counting 18,000 members. And there's also a forum where you can get answers to your questions immediately and browse other people's questions. There is a special forum for the 3D portfolio, so you can be the first one to start a conversation. And while we were going through that, our website got set up. So let's go ahead and click manage site. And there we go. We have everything we need. Now we're gonna use this at the end of this video to deploy our great looking 3D developer portfolio to your own domain name. With that said, let's dive straight into the code. To get started with our great 3D developer portfolio, we're gonna start as we always do on the JavaScript Mastery YouTube channel from bare beginnings by creating a new empty folder on our desktop called 3D underscore portfolio. Once you create it, you can drag and drop it to your empty Visual Studio Code window. Inside of here, you can go to View and then Terminal and we can start initializing our application. To initialize the app, we're gonna use a tool called Vite. Recently, it became more popular and more powerful than Create React App. So we can start by running the command npm create Vite at latest, dot slash to create it in the current repository, dash dash, dash dash template, React. This is going to create a new 
MT React application. And before running npm install and npm run dev, there's a couple of other packages we need to install. One of the main packages, of course, being Tailwind CSS, an incredibly popular utility-first CSS framework that's going to make the styling of our entire application easier. If you've never used Tailwind CSS, no worries, I'm gonna teach you how to do that. And if you have, then you know how great it is. Let's go to docs and let's install it using Tailwind CLI. The first command we have to run is npm install dash D Tailwind CSS. So let's simply paste it right here and press enter. Once Tailwind is installed, you can also initialize it. So let's copy the second command and run it right here. And that's all that we need to do for now. Now let's focus on installing all of the additional packages we'll be using in our application. We can do that by running npm install. And instead of simply installing it, we need to add an additional flag to this npm installation, dash dash legacy, dash peer, dash depths. One of the packages we'll be using, specifically React Tilt, uses older versions of React. So for that reason, we have to install legacy peer depths. This is something you'll use often when using some older packages. With that said, let's provide a list of all of the packages we need to install. The first and most important one being react-3 forward slash fiber. This is a React-based 3.js library that's going to allow us to create 3.js code in a React fashion. We also need at react-3 forward slash dre and math math for math utility functions. When working with 3.js, there's going to be a lot of geometry and we definitely need those utility functions. There's react-tilt that's going to provide a really cool animation when hovering over our cards. React-vertical-timeline-component for the experience similar to the one on LinkedIn. Add email.js forward slash browser. Then we're going to need framer motion and react-router-dom for routing. You can press enter and wait for all of these dependencies to install. This usually takes just about a minute, so you can pause this video and I'll be right back. Once the dependencies are installed, before running our application, there's a couple of things I prepared for you before we dive into the code. These are, of course, some assets and files that I prepare for you to make our coding workflow a bit simpler. I spend a lot of time finding the best possible assets and 3D models, and I simply want to give them all to you right away. So in the description down below, first, you can find the zipped public folder. You can copy it, and then you can delete the current public folder and paste it right here in the root of our directory. This public folder is going to contain the desktop underscore PC, which is a 3D model, as well as the planet model. After getting the public folder, we also need to get our assets. So for now, delete the assets folder and down below, download and unzip the updated assets folder and paste it inside of the source. There, we're going to use all of the icons and images for the application. Finally, the last zipped folder you'll need to get is going to be the components folder. So inside of the source, you can simply paste the unzipped components folder. If you go into it, you're going to see that there seems to be a lot of components here, but don't let that scare you or make you think, hey, am I actually going to code anything this video? Yes, you will. Absolutely everything because these right here is just an empty structure for all of these components, which you, with me on the side, will create. Great, we can close all of these currently open files. And now that's going to be it for all of these zipped folders, but there's gonna be some additional code I'm gonna to provide to you. First of all, we can delete the app.css file as we won't need it. We can modify the app.jsx because right now inside of here, we have some default structure provided to us by Vite. We don't really need that. So we can simply create a new empty div and say 3D developer portfolio. We don't need this use state. We can turn this into a modern arrow function and we don't need these imports. There we go. Nice and clean. 
in the description down below, you'll find a GitHub gist file. Inside of that GitHub gist, you'll find the code for the index CSS. As you can see, we have 200 lines here. You can copy the code from the GitHub gist and paste it right here in the index.css. As you can see, we do have about 200 lines of CSS, but there's not a lot of styling here. Most of these are simply gradients and box shadows, as well as the Tailwind imports and the import of the font we'll be using. After getting the index CSS in the same GitHub gist, you'll also find a new style.js file, which you can create within the source folder and you can paste the code. Here, we created some useful Tailwind utility styles for the hero head text, subtext, section head text, and section subtext as well. After getting the style.js, we also want to update the tailwind.config.cjs. You can also find that in the GitHub gist down below and paste it here. This is going to contain just some primary, secondary, and tertiary colors, as well as the box shadows, screens, and the background image. Next, we can create a new folder in the source folder called utils, inside of which we can create a new motion.js file. This file I also provided to you in the GitHub just down below, so you can simply copy it and paste it right here. There, I prepared some framer motion animations that we can use throughout our project. And finally, believe me, this is the last one. You can create a new folder called constants and create a new file called index.js within those constants. In that same GitHub gist, you can copy and paste all of the content that we're gonna have in our application. The services, technologies, experiences, testimonials, and projects. Instead of putting all of this text within our code, we have placed it in a single source of truth file where you'll be able to change it once and it's going to be referenced everywhere else. That means that you can change this specific experience, the date, the points, you can change everything to match it to your developer experience. And that's going to be reflected in the code. Great. With that said, we can close all of the currently open files, we can collapse the file tree, we can go to view, and then terminal. And we can run npm run dev to run our application on localhost 5173. To open it, you can hold control and then click it. Now we can put the editor side by side to our browser so that we can see the changes that we make live. And there we go. Our Visual Studio Code window on the left side and our browser that says 3D Developer Portfolio on the right side. That means that we are ready to get started with the development. We're gonna start by creating the structure or the layout or the skeleton of our application by going to source and then app.jsx. Inside of here, we need to import all of the components we've just created. So let's get started by importing the browser router coming from react-router-dom. We're gonna use for routing. We can then import all of our components by saying import inside of curly braces, about, contact, experience, feedbacks, hero, navbar, tech, works, as well as stars canvas. This is all coming from that slash components. And now we can focus on creating the layout. We're first going to wrap everything in a browser router component, which is going to allow us to route. Inside of there, we're gonna have a div and that div is going to have a class name equal to relative z-0 and bg-primary. If we save this, you'll be able to see that there's nothing on the screen. So within this div, let's also create another div. And that div is going to have a class name equal to bg-hero-pattern, also bg-cover, bg-no-repeat, and bg-center. Inside of there, we can render the self-closing navbar and the self-closing hero component. And once this is implemented, you should be able to see a black background with just the navbar and hero components, which are essentially just p tags. With that said, we can now go below this inner div right here, 
and we can reference all of our components one by one. Each one of these components is actually a section. So first we're going to have the about section, then we're going to have the experience section, which is another self closing tag. Then we're going to have the tech section to showcase the technologies we want to work with. Then we're going to have the works section, which are going to be our projects. And finally, the feedback section. Below that, we want to have another inner div that's going to have a class name equal to relative as well as Z-0. We need this because later on, we'll be displaying some stars right here, 3D star objects. And inside of there, we want to have our contact and the stars canvas. Now, if we save this, you can see all of the other sections appear right here. That means that we are ready to get started developing all of these sections one by one from top to bottom. The first one on our list is of course going to be the navbar. So we can control click to go into the navbar component and we can get started with developing it. Our navbar is going to be pretty simple and straightforward because the main focus is of course going to be on the 3D models we're going to create. So inside of the navbar, we're going to have our logo, the name, about, work, and contact. That's about it. And that's all that you actually need. So let's go back to our application and let's get started with developing it. We're first going to import everything we need. So that's going to be react as well as use effect and use state coming from react. After that, we can import the link component from react router dom, which we're going to use to navigate to other parts of our page. Then we can import styles coming from dot dot slash styles. We can also import nav links coming from dot dot slash constants. And finally, we can import the logo, the menu and the close assets coming from dot dot slash assets. And that's it, we are ready to get started. You can see we get an error. And that's because right here, I named this style instead of styles. So let's simply rename it to styles if it's not styles for you already. Great. So inside of our navbar, let's start with the JSX, we're going to remove this div and replace it with the semantic nav tag. That semantic tag is going to have a class name that is going to be a dynamic template string. Inside of there, we're going to render styles dot padding X like this. This is a special utility class that we have created, which if you go to styles, simply provides the PX six, meaning padding horizontal six. And then on smaller devices, it provides a bit more padding. Now to that class, we can also add a few additional things. So let's bring this back in one line. We're going to also give it a W dash full, meaning we want it to take full width, a flex property items dash center to make it appear in a center padding Y of five fixed top dash zero, which is going to make it stay on the top Z 20 to make it appear above other elements. And we also want to give it a BG dash primary. Now, if we save this, nothing's going to happen because it's currently empty. So inside of that nav, let's create a new div. And that div is going to have a class name equal to W dash full flex justify dash between items dash center max dash W dash seven XL, meaning we really want to have a lot of width in our nav bar, and then margin X auto. There we go. Now, if you're wondering what any of these class names mean, simply visit tailwind documentation. You can go to tailwindcss.com and there visit their doc site. Inside of the docs, there's this magnifying glass icon. If you click it, you can literally type any specific class and you'll be able to see what it does with a detailed explanation. For example, W dash full simply makes the element take the full width. So if you're wondering what any of these classes mean, for example, flex or fixed, you can immediately see that right here. Great. With that said, let's continue developing our navbar. 
within our div, we want to have a link component. That link is going to point to just forward slash, meaning the top of the page. We also want to give it a class name equal to flex items dash center and gap dash two. Now this is a special react router dom link. So we can also give it an on click property, set a callback function. And there we want to set active to be equal to nothing. And this set active is going to keep track of where we are currently on the page. So let's create that as a new use state field. That's going to be use state snippet, active, set active, at the start set to an empty string. And then if we click that, we want to window dot scroll to zero, zero. This is going to scroll to the top of the page. Now within that link, we want to render an image. And that image is going to be a self closing tag. That's going to have a source equal to logo, alt equal to logo, and a class name equal to w dash nine for width age dash nine for height, object dash contain, and we can save it. And there you can see a huge letter A with a circle. This is my logo as my name is Adrian. But you might want to show a different letter here. So let me show you how you can do just that. You can visit logo.com. Such a great domain name, I know. And then in here, you can enter your name. So let's say the name is john. Maybe you can enter just J for John. Then you can enter your slogan or you can skip that. You can skip the industry. You can choose the color palette. You can choose the type. And then you can say without icons. And just like that, logo is going to generate a new J logo. For example, this circle one that you can customize and simply download and use on your website. It's as easy as that. So we can now go back to the website. And instead of this logo, you can use your own. Now you can also use that logo in the favicon right here. So to do that, you can go to that's going to be index.html. And right here, you can rename this to I'm going to do Adrian portfolio, maybe just like that. And you can do your name, and then portfolio, that's going to make it just look a bit better on top. And then in here, you can import that image that you specified. In my case, I'm just going to add a link tag and link to forward slash logo dot SVG. Again, you can use the one that you have imported, and that should make it look great right here as well. With that said, let's style this logo just a bit better by providing a P tag right below it. That P tag in my case is going to say Adrian, and then we're going to have a space and a span element within that P tag. That's going to say JavaScript mastery. In your case, you can simply leave your first and last name as it is your personal portfolio. That P tag is going to have a class name equal to text dash white text dash 18 pixels inside of square brackets, font dash bold and cursor dash pointer. If we save that, it should look like this. But we also need to style this span tag that's going to have a class name equal to on small devices block usually hidden because it's a bit too long for these small devices. Now it looks like that even though we apply w dash nine and h dash nine, as well as text dash white for the color, the image is still huge and the color is not white which would make me assume that the Tailwind CSS classes are not being applied, which is a great opportunity for me to show you how we can debug this together. So let's do that right away. A quick Google search of Tailwind CSS not working with Vite led me to Tailwind CSS docs, which you can see right here. And we already were on a page that was similar to this one, but this one is now installing it using React. So instead of installing simply Tailwind CSS like we did, we also have to add post CSS and auto prefixer. So now let's go to view terminal, stop the application from running, and then type npm install dash D. But now we're going to install the post CSS and auto prefixer. 
we also need to add that extra dash dash legacy dash peer dash depths as we discussed before. And let's press enter. Once these install, we need to run mpx tailwind css init dash p, paste it right here. That's going to do its job because right now you should be able to see post CSS config as well and our Tailwind CSS config from before. With that said, we should be able to go to view, terminal, and then run npm run dev, which should rerun our application. Now closing this file and going back, we can see that now we have a proper looking navbar, which means that our Tailwind CSS styles are being applied. And this mistake that I've just made matters because as you can see, not even myself or other YouTubers are always perfect and always write perfect code. Every single developer is often running into bugs and errors, but it's how quickly you manage to resolve them that matters. And that's why I wanted to include the process of debugging this into this video, even with the procedure of showing you what Google search term I used that led me to the solution. And this is exactly what I include in all of my YouTube videos. So if you haven't already, definitely make sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell to get more videos just like this one. And that's also what we include in our JSM Masterclass Experience program, which is also going to be linked down below if you're more into personalized one-on-one -on -one learning. With that said, we can now proceed with developing our navbar and we can continue right where we left off below our link. Below our link, we're gonna have a UL tag that's going to have a class name equal to list-none hidden on small devices flex, usually flex-row and gap-10. Inside of there, we can open a new dynamic block of code, say navlinks.map, where we get each individual link. And for each link, we want to render an LI, a list item a list item that's going to have an anchor tag within it and that's going to have an href equal to a dynamic template string of hash nav-id. And of course, there has to be a dollar sign in front. And there we can render the nav.title. Now, if we save this, it's going to break, of course, because in here we said nav and this right here should have been link. So let's change this to link.id and link.title. And immediately you can see the about, work, and contact, which is looking great. Now this li also has to have a key, and key is going to be equal to link.id. It's going to have a class name. Inside of the class name, we want to check if this li is currently active. And we can do that by opening new dynamic block of code and checking active, is triple equal to link.title. If that is the case, then we can render the text-white color. And if it's not active, we can render the text-secondary color. Let's close it, save it, and now we can see that these are currently not active as they're grayed out. Below that, we can also add a couple more class names, such as on hover text-white, text-18 pixels of size, font-medium and cursor-pointer. Now, if we save that, these get a bit bigger and now we can hover over them, indicating we can click them. Finally, on click on that LI, we want to have a callback function that's going to set active to link.title. Now, if we click about, you can notice the URL changes to hash about, and also this one is white. Same thing for all of the other links as well. Now, below this UL, we're gonna have a div. And that div is going to be for our mobile navigation bar because sometimes we won't have enough space to fit all of these links right here. So we have to be smart and create something that looks like this, a mobile navigation bar. So let's do just that. If we're on small devices, then we won't show the links right here, but rather we're gonna show them within this div. This div can have a class name, that's going to be on small devices hidden, usually flex, flex dash one, justify dash end, and items dash center. Inside of that div, we want to have a self-closing image. Image that's going to have a source equal to menu. 
it's also going to have an alt tag that's equal to menu. It's going to have a class name equal to w-28 pixels, h-28 pixels, object-contain, and cursor-pointer. Finally, it's going to have an on-click property because once we click it, we want to change the state. So we're going to have a callback function with set toggle is equal to not toggle. So going all the way up, we need to create a new use state field. That's going to be toggle, set toggle, which at the start is going to be set to false. Now, if we save that, you should be able to see this menu icon. Now, this menu icon should change depending if we have clicked the toggle. So we can say if toggle, then we want to show menu, else we want to show close. Or rather, it's going to be the other way around. We want to close it if it's currently opened, and we want to show the menu if it's currently closed. So now you can click it and toggle it. But of course, now below that image, we have to show the actual menu. So below the image, create a new div. That div is going to have a class name equal to a dynamic template string. If it's not toggled, then we want to show hidden like this. And else we want to show flex, meaning we want to show it. Now it's also going to have a P-6 and we can already start seeing it if we expand it. P-6 for padding. It's going to have a black dash gradient it's going to have absolute top dash 20. There we go. You can see that black square, right dash zero, MX dash four for margin horizontal, MI dash two for margin vertical, min dash W for width of 140 pixels inside of square brackets. And we also want to give it Z dash 10 to appear over other elements and make it rounded dash XL. And this is going to be our menu. Now inside of there, we can render almost the same UL that we have rendered above. So let's go ahead and copy it, scroll down and paste it within this div. So this UL right here is going to render different elements. But of course, we have to change it just a bit. It's going to be list dash none. But instead of it being hidden by default, it's going to be flex by default like this. We don't need on small devices flex. Instead of flex row and gap 10, it's going to have justify dash end, items dash start, flex dash call, and gap dash four. And there we go. Our elements appeared right here. Now we can give some class names to our LI. So let's change these to font dash poppins, font dash medium, cursor dash pointer and text dash 16 pixels. Now, if we save this, it's going to look just a bit better. And on top of setting the active link, we also want to do something else. So we can turn this into a regular function block that looks like this. And we can also set toggle to not toggle. That's going to, of course, close it once we click on a specific link. So now we can manually open and close it. And we can also click, which is going to navigate to work and automatically close it. Great. That means that now we have the mobile menu done as well. And we can go back and expand this right here. There we go. Now this Adrian JavaScript mastery is still looking a bit weird. So what we can do is scroll up. Most likely your name is a bit shorter, so it might look better. I'll try JS mastery right here but still it is kind of breaking. And that's because instead of using a space right here, I can use a Unicode character and NBSP and then semicolon. This is the actual Unicode character for an empty space. And then we can just leave this right here. And then if I put that right here on a new line and then the span on the second line within the P tag, that's going to make it appear in the same line. And most importantly, next to this cursor pointer, we can also give it a flex style. That's going to make it appear in one row and we can add an extra space right here. But as you can see, it is tied together. So what we can do is we can add the Unicode character 
and NBSP semicolon, which is a Unicode space character. So now this is looking great. And if we expand it, you can see this is looking good and it gets centered in the middle as does the right side. This is a great and a simple navigation bar. Although on the right side right here, we do have some space. Let's see if I collapse it just a bit. Will the space be there? As you can see, there is some space here and we don't have it here. That means that we have to get some things fixed. And we can do that if we scroll all the way up and fix this padded to padding. If we do that, it is looking perfect. Hopefully you have your own logo right here and your own name. With that said, we can close our nav bar and we can proceed with the most interesting part of this entire video and the project, which is the hero section. The hero section is going to have this great 3D model that we spent a lot of time looking for. We found it for you. So get ready to develop it right here together with me. To get started, we can first import motion coming from, of course, Framer Motion. Yep, the hero section is going to have some animations. We can then import the styles coming from dot dot slash styles, as well as import the computer canvas coming from dot slash canvas. Inside of our JSX, we can turn this div into a section. And that section is going to have a class name equal to, it's going to be relative, w full h screen, meaning it's going to take the entire screen, and then mx auto for margin auto. And that's going to generate this nicely looking background right here. Inside of that section, we want to create a div. And this div is going to have a class name that's going to be a dynamic template string of styles dot padding X. So it's going to provide some padding. Then it's going to be absolute. It's going to be inset zero. Inside of this div, we're going to have this text that you can see right here. Then we also want to give it a top dash 120 pixels to divide it from the top max dash w dash seven XL MX auto flex flex dash row items dash start and gap dash five. And finally, within that we can create a new div that's going to have a class name equal to flex flex dash call justify dash center items dash center and MT five for margin top. Inside of there, we can render this circle and this line right here. So to do that, we can create a self closing div that's going to have a class name equal to w dash five, h dash five, rounded dash full, and bg dash hash 915 eff. If we save that, we should be able to see that circle right here. Let's pull our browser a bit to the right. And now we can create that line by creating another self closing div with a class name equal to w dash one on small devices h dash 80, usually h dash 40. And that's going to be violet dash gradient. There we go. So now we have the line as well. And we are ready to create our text. So that's going to be below this div containing these two divs. Below, we can create another div that's going to have an H1. H1 is going to say hi, I am, and we can do a span here. So that span is going to have a class name equal to text dash inside of square brackets, hash 915 EFF. And there inside of the span, you can put your name. In my case, it's Adrian. So if we save it, you'll be able to see hi, I'm Adrian. And we can now make that a bit bigger by applying a class name to this H1. That's going to be a dynamic of styles dot hero head text. And it's going to be text dash white. And there we go. This is already looking so much better. Below that H1, we can create a new P tag that's going to have a class name equal to, it's going to be dynamic as well, 
styles.hero sub text. It's going to have margin top two to divide it a bit from the title and text dash white dash 100. Inside of there, you can type the description of who you are as a developer. In this case, I'm going to say I develop 3D visuals, user interfaces, and web applications. Of course, feel free to modify this to suit your needs. Now, we want to break this into two lines. So between user and interfaces, I'm going to add a break tag, a self-closing break tag, that's going to be there on small devices. So class name on small devices block, meaning it's there, and usually it is hidden. There we go. This is looking great. Now we can focus on rendering the computer canvas. So going below this div right here, we can render the self-closing computer canvas component, which for now is just going to say computers. And we don't want to put that on the side right here. We want to put it below. So we need to exit this div and one more div. So it's going to be right on top of the section like this. It's not even visible right here because it's being covered. So what we can do now is we can control click into computer canvas and we can start creating our first 3JS React 3 Fiber canvas. We can do that by importing a lot of things from React. These are going to be suspense, use effect, and use state. After that, we also need to import something known as a canvas. And that's coming from add react-3 forward slash fiber. Canvas is just an empty canvas allowing us to place something on it. And finally, we want to import a couple of helpers. They're going to help us to draw on this canvas. That's going to be orbit controls, preload, and use GLTF, the most important part, which is going to allow us to import 3D models. And these handy utility functions are coming from add react-3 forward slash Dre. And finally, we also want to import the canvas loader coming from dot dot slash loader. So this is a component we haven't yet created, but we will soon. Now inside of computers, we can import our GLTF model. So we can do that by saying const computer is equal to use GLTF. And then we pass a path that is dot slash desktop underscore PC forward slash scene dot GLTF. Now, if you go to the Explorer and you see the public, you'll be able to see a desktop underscore PC. And there we have the scene dot GLTF. This is the model that I prepared for you. Great. Now let's make use of that model. First of all, when creating 3JS elements, we're not going to start with a div. Rather, we're going to start with something called a mesh like this. Inside of that mesh, we have to create a light because otherwise we wouldn't be able to see anything. So let's add a hemisphere light. It's going to have an intensity equal to 0.15 and a ground color equal to black. Now, if you save that, we still cannot see anything, but we are just starting. Of course, if any of these properties are new to you, let's go to react three fiber docs, and then let's search for them. I'm going to search for adding lights. There we go. So you can see that we need to create a canvas and then there's the ambient light, directional light, and a lot of different types of lights. So this is how it should look like just an empty light but we're going to add that computer model as well. So we don't light just the box. We light something that is incredibly interesting, which is this desk and the monitor as well as the PC. You see this glare on this monitor as I turn it around, that is a point light. So let's create that point light as well. That's going to be point light with an intensity equal to one. And finally, we're going to create something known as a primitive. That's going to be a self-closing component to which we can pass the object that's going to be equal to computer.scene. Now, if we save this, maybe we're hoping to see the computer, but we cannot see it yet. 
don't worry, we will see it as soon as we load it into our React 3 Fiber Canvas. So to do that, we're going to create a new component right below our computers. It's going to be called const computer canvas like this. And inside of there, we can return a canvas. That canvas is not going to be a self-closing component. We will put something into it. But first, let's define some props. We're going to pass frame loop is going to be equal to demand. Below frame loop, we can also add shadows. So yes, we do want to play with shadows. After shadows, we have to define a camera, which is the most important part of every 3D scene. It is where are we looking at this model from? So imagine a camera right here looking at this specific angle. In 3D geometry, it's really important where the camera and the lights are coming from. So in this case, we can set the position inside of an object to be 20, which is X axis, three, which is Y axis, and then five, which is Z axis. I found these values to look the best. And finally, we also need to specify an FOV or field of view. This is how wide our field of view is going to be. In this case, I found the value of 25 to work the best. Great. Now we still cannot see anything, but let's provide a GL property. And there we can say preserve drawing buffer. I found this value needs to be there to properly render our model. Great. Now what we can do is we can also add a suspense. This is not related to 3JS. This is coming from React. And this allows us to have a loader while our model is loading. So that is going to be our canvas loader. Inside of it, we want to show orbit controls. And these controls are going to allow us to move the model left and right, as you can see right here. And to those controls, we can pass enable zoom to set false because we don't want to zoom this in. We wanted to leave it as it is. And finally, we want to add a couple of additional props. So let's put this on a new line. That's going to be max polar angle is equal to math that P pi over two. And we want to do min polar angle as well. Great. So what this allows us to do is not to rotate this all the way around up and down left and right, we can only rotate it around a specific angle around a specific axis, this is going to make it look a bit more streamlined. And most importantly, we can render the computers component right here. So that's going to be computers. If I could spell it as a self closing component. Great, it's within this suspense. And then below the suspense, we want to add a preload of all and close it as a self closing component. Now, if we reload the page, everything is going to break as it usually does. And that's good. We can open up the console, inspect, and then go here. And we can see that there aren't any errors whatsoever. So let's open up the terminal as well. And right here, we do see an error. It's saying that it's trying to get something from a package called three. And if you think about it, we didn't really install the package called three at the start. And it is necessary for us to install the original 3JS package for React 3 Fiber to be able to use it. So we can say npm install dash dash legacy dash peer dash depths. And we want to install three. That is the original 3JS package. Once we have that, we can rerun the npm run dev command. Now our application is running. And if we reload it, we can now see a black screen, which again means something went wrong. So let's try to debug it. First of all, I can notice that I typed position instead of position right here. So let's fix that. Still a dark screen. And right here, I type pint light instead of point light. So if we fix that, okay, we do get something, we can see our great looking model, but it's showing on top of our computer, which is not ideal. So what we can do is we can fix it a bit, we can change this primitive object model by applying some additional properties, such as scale, we can change the scale of the object. And let's make it for example, 1.75 
of its size, which is going to make it a bit smaller. We want to change the position as well. And that's going to be an array of x, y and z axes. So that's going to be zero minus 3.25 and minus 1.5. I found these values to work the best as you can see right here. Finally, we want to change the rotation to be equal to an array of minus 0.01, minus 0.2, and minus 0.1. There we go. So this is going to rotate it really nicely on the screen. And our model is here. We have this point light. Now, if I comment it out, you can see there is no light. We only have this hemispheric light. But what if we comment that one out as well? It's looking really dark. Our model has no light whatsoever. Let's bring back the point light. Okay, just a bit better. You can see this glare happening on the screen. Let's bring back the hemispheric one. Okay, just a bit more. And now we're going to add the main light. That's going to be the spotlight. So let's create a new spot light. It's going to have a position equal to an array of minus 20, 50, and 10. There we go. So you can see how immediately everything got a bit brighter. Let's also change the angle of that light to 0 0.12. Let's set a penumbra to one. This is a property that I don't know what it does, but it made it look better. Intensity is going to be set to one, which I think is one by default. We can apply a cast shadow property, which is going to cast a shadow as well, which is quite cool. And finally, we're going to set the shadow dash map size of 1024. There we go. This is looking wonderful. Now we have our hemispheric light, point light, spotlight, and the primitive computer scene object, which is not so primitive. It has a speaker, some mouse, a keyboard, a computer screen with Visual Studio Code on it to denote you're a developer, and a nice gaming PC. Great. So what did we do? We created this really nice 3D mesh with a couple of lights and a primitive object. We imported that object by using use GLTF, and then we imported it from the public folder right here, which are prepared for you. If you're wondering, hey, where can I get all of these three models? And Adrian, where did you find them? Well, simply Google 3D models download and go through a couple of sites. You have a lot of free 3D models. The models like these ones, which are not really quality. There's also the Turbo Squid, which has a lot of them. But I found Sketchfab to be the best one. You simply have to go to Explore and click Downloadable. There you can find a lot of cool objects and you can simply download them and then use them within your code in the same way that we did with the desktop PC. The more you know, right? Great. Now we can go back to the portfolio and we can admire our great hero model, which is looking great. Now, while it's loading, it does take some time. And in this case, it even seems to break initially once we reload. So what we can do is we can also fix the canvas loader component. So let's control click into the canvas loader. And there we want to get something from react three Dre. So let's import HTML use progress. And that's going to come from react tree Dre. That's going to be the canvas loader. And we can get the progress coming from equal use progress. There we want to render some HTML. So right here, we can say HTML. We want to show a span that's going to have a class name equal to canvas dash loader. And below that span, we want to show a P tag that's going to render the progress dot two fixed to two decimals. And then that's going to be a percentage, of course, like this. So we want to show the progress of the load of that model. Let's apply some styles to this P tag. That's going to be a font size of 14, a color equal to hash f1, 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 a font weight equal to 800, and a margin top of 40. There we go. Now, if we save this and reload the page, you saw that loader for a second there, right? Really nicely shows the percentage and then loads the model, 
which makes everything work. That is great. So hopefully you got the model working as well. If you haven't, the link to the entire project is going to be down in the description. You can visit the GitHub repository and then you can override the computers.jsx file to ensure you have the right code. Great. With that said, we can go back to the hero page and continue developing it. Below our computers, we want to make it accessible for mobile devices as well. And on desktops, we want to let people know that they can actually scroll down with this cool scrolling GIF. So right here, we can do this. It's immediately going to go to the next section. So let me show you how to develop this. And when I said it's a GIF, it's not. You're not going to simply import this and slap it in. We're gonna develop this little thing using Framer Motion. So below the computer canvas, let's go ahead and create a new div. That div is going to have a class name of absolute because we have to position it in the middle. On extra small devices, it's going to have a bottom 10. Usually it's going to have a bottom 32. It's going to be full width, flex, justify dash center and items dash center as well. Within that div, we want to show an anchor tag. So a tag that's going to have an href equal to hash and then about because we want to scroll down. Inside of that href, we're gonna have a div and that div is going to have a class name equal to w-35 pixels, h-64 pixels, rounded-3xl, border-4, border-secondary, flex, justify-center, items-start, and p-2. If we now save this, you should be able to see this rectangle appear right there. And within it, we want to create, first time in this video, a motion.div. This means that we are using Framer Motion to create it. It's going to be a self-closing component. And what do we wanna animate? Well, we want to animate just the Y property, the Y axis, zero, 24, zero. So we wanna move it 24 pixels up and down. And how is the transition going to look like? Well, transition is going to be duration of 1.5 seconds, repeat to infinity, and repeat type is going to be equal to loop. So we wanna loop it to the infinity. Now we wanna give it a class name of w-3, h-3, rounded-full, bg-secondary, and margin bottom one, and save it. And there we go. In Framer Motion, we've just built this little circle that jumps up and down within this div that we have created. And now if we click right here, it's going to scroll to the about section, which we don't yet have, so it cannot do that. But trust me, later on, it will. It's going to look just like here on the finished site. Great. Now, maybe there's one question you have. How is this going to look like on mobile? Is it actually going to look good? Well, let's give it a shot. I'm going to collapse this. And okay, it's not bad, but it's not good either. So what we can do is we can go back to our computer canvas and within the canvas, we can create a new use state field called is mobile. There, we're gonna start, set it to false. And then we wanna add a new use effect. Inside of this use effect, we wanna check if we are on a mobile device, which we can do by getting the media query. And we can get that by checking the window that match media. And then if it matches, max dash width is something like 500 pixels. In that case, we're gonna know that we're on the mobile device. So we can say set is mobile is media query that matches. Are we on the device that's lower than 500 pixels of width? Finally, whenever the width changes, we need to modify that. So we can say handle media query change. And that's going to take in an event and it's going to simply set is mobile to be equal to event.matches. Now, since we are in React and within the use effect, 
we have to add an event listener and then we have to remove it. So we can see media query dot add event listener of change. We want to call the handle media query change. But again, since we are in the use effect, we have to close that media query listener. So we can do that by saying media query dot remove event listener change handle media query change. And we don't need to have anything in our dependency array. So now that the only thing this entire use effect is doing is changing the is mobile variable. And now we'll be able to use that is mobile variable to change the model and make it smaller. So let's simply pass the is mobile is equal to is mobile to our computers. Let's go to our computers, take it in as a prop is mobile. And now based on that prop, we can change the scale first of all. So going back to the scale, we can check if is mobile, in that case 0 0.7, else 0 0.75. So it's going to be just a bit smaller. Let's try to reload and check it out. Okay, maybe it's a bit too big, we'll see soon. We're going to change the position as well. So we're going to say if is mobile, the position is going to be an array of 0, minus 3, and then minus 2.2. And that should be it. But it's still it's not looking that good. So let's see if our media query is being applied. And I don't think it is because we are missing the closing parenthesis right here. And we're also missing the measure, which is pixels. If we save that, all of the styling changes for is mobile are going to be applied. Great. Now I know this use effect is a bit weird. So let me just reapply it with some additional comments that might make it make a bit more sense. So first of all, we add an event listener that changes to the screen size. Then we set the initial value of the is mobile state variable. Then we define a callback function to handle changes to the media query. We add the callback function as a listener to the changes to the media query and then we remove the listener when the component is unmounted. What this does is now it treats it as a mobile. But if we go a bit up, you can see it treats it as a desktop. And that is working flawlessly without using any additional external libraries. With that said, our model is now done. And with it, the entire hero section. Now we can scroll down to the next section, which is the about section. Inside of there, we're going to work with these great cards with the react tilt component, as well as introduce ourselves in the overview. So let's go ahead and get started with that right away. To get started with our about section, we can first import a couple of things. The first one being something called tilt coming from react dash tilt. We're going to use this to tilt the cards that we're displaying. Notice how when I scroll over, we have this nice, clean tilt. And that happens in all the cards. And for that, we're using this package. Then we can also import motion coming from react framer motion. We also can import these styles coming from dot dot slash styles. We can import the services coming from dot dot slash constants. And we can import a couple of utils, such as fade in and text variant coming from dot dot slash utils forward slash motion. Great. Now we can dive into creating our about section, first starting with the introduction overview, and then the description. So let's scroll down to the about. And we're going to wrap everything in just a regular react fragment, that's going to look like this. Inside of there, we're going to have a motion dot div. And inside of there, we're going to render a p tag that's going to say introduction. And below that, we're going to render an h2 tag that is going to say overview with a dot at the end to make it a bit more dramatic. And to those we can provide a class name equal to styles dot section subtext. And to h2, we can provide a class name equal to styles dot section head text. And if we save that, you can see the introduction and the overview appear right here. 
Now we are instead of emotion div, so we want to animate it. So let's provide variance is equal to a function call of the text variant utility function that we have created. So let's save it. And now if we reload the page, and not now, but later, you'll be able to see these pieces of text will animate. Right now, we don't have a lot of scroll real estate, so we cannot show that, but that will happen soon. Now we can focus on creating this P tag, which is this text right here. Below this motion div, we can create a motion.p. Here, we want to give it a variant, variants equal to fade in. And it accepts four parameters. First, the direction. At the start, we can make it empty. Then type. At the start, it can be empty as well. Then the delay, 0.1 second. And finally, the duration of the animation, which is going to be one second. And inside of here, you can write something about yourself. I'm going to paste a block of text, something like I'm a skilled software developer with experience in TypeScript, JavaScript, and expertise in frameworks like React, Node.js, and 3.js and a couple of other pieces of text. So we have it right here. Now let's divide it from the top a bit by giving it a class name equal to empty-4. Let's also change the color to text-secondary. Let's increase the font size to text-17 pixels. Let's set the width to max-w-3xl. And let's set the leading to 30 pixels. There we go. So that's going to make it a bit more readable. Of course, feel free to change this text to whatever you like. This is just an example. Finally, below this P tag, we want to create a div. We want to display these cards. So we can create a div that's going to have a class name equal to MT-20 to divide it from the top, flex, flex-wrap, and gap-10 to provide some spacing between the cards. Then we want to loop over the services, so services.map, where we get each individual service and its index. And for each service, we want to render a custom service card self-closing component to which we can provide a key, service.title, index as well. And finally, we can spread all of the properties coming from the service we are currently looping over. Now, this is not going to work because the service card is undefined. But if we scroll up right above the about, we can create a new functional component, const service card. Our service card component is going to simply return something. For now, that can be simply a p tag rendering the service dot title. And then where are we getting the title from? That's going to come from the props. So we're going to get the index, the title, as well as the icon. So we don't even have to say service that title, we are immediately getting it through props. So now if you scroll down, you can see web developer, react native developer, and so on. And all of these are coming from services. So this is in the constants. Remember when I told you, you'll be able to change everything in one file. Well, you can do that here. Maybe you're not a React Native developer, so feel free to change this right here. And you can also change the icons. Great. Now let's develop this great looking card. We're going to first use a so-called tilt component coming from React Tilt. And we can give it a class name of on extra small devices. Width is going to be 250 pixels. And usually width is going to be full. And inside of it, we can render a motion div. That motion div is going to have variance of fade in. It's going to fade in from the right side. It's going to have a type of spring. The delay is going to be 0.5 seconds, but is going to be multiplied for every index meaning that first is going to start at zero. The second one is going to be 0.5 times one, which is 0.5. And then we're going to have one and more. And the last property is the duration. So that's going to be 0.75 seconds. And this was supposed to be fade in. There we go. Finally, we can give it a class name equal to w-full green-pink-gradient 
padding dash one pixel, rounded dash 20 pixels, and then finally shadow dash card. If we save this, you can see four what appear to be lines, but soon enough, these will be cards as soon as we add something in them. So let's create a div and that div is going to have some options. The options are going to be max 45, scale of one, and then speed is equal to 450. These are the tilt options that we're providing to this card. Finally, that div is going to have a class name equal to BG dash tertiary, rounded dash 20 pixels, padding Y of five and padding X of 12. Already these look like cards min dash H dash 280 pixels. So this is the minimum card height. Okay, looking great. And then flex justify dash evenly items dash center and flex dash call inside of there, we need to show the icon. So what we can do is render the self closing image tag with a source equal to icon. The alt can be title and class name can be W-16 for the width, H-16 for the height, and object-contain. And there we go. We have our wonderful icons. And we can also add an H3 that's going to render the title. But of course, we have to style it a bit. So let's give it a class name equal to text-white, text-20 pixels to make it a bit larger font dash bold, and most importantly, text dash center. There we go. These are some great looking cards. And with that, we're done with the service card. And we're almost close to being done with our about section. But you can see that it is still looking a bit weird. Even if you expand it, it goes all the way to the left side. And there's so much empty space to the right side. Now we're going to fix this, but not only for this specific section, we're going to fix it for all of the sections we're going to create in the future. Because what you can notice is that they all have the same amount of space available on the left side and on the right side, they're all centered in the middle. So we want to create one component, which is going to wrap all of our sections to make them look good. Let me show you how to do that using something called a higher order component. So create a new folder in the source folder called HOC higher order component. Inside of there, create a new section wrapper.jsx and run RAFCE. This is going to be a regular component in many ways, but it's also considered a higher order component. Inside of there, we're going to import motion coming from Framer motion. We're going to also import styles coming from dot dot slash styles. And we're going to import the stagger container coming from utils dash motion. This is going to be our section wrapper. And since it's a wrapper, we need to get the original component we're passing into it. So that's going to be component and also the ID name, which we're going to use to navigate or scroll to specific sections. Each one has to have its own ID. Now, the reason why this is a higher order component is because we're going to have another component right inside of it. So this is a component that is instantly going to return another function, function HOC, which is another function. So this is a function returning a function. And we're going to have a return statement inside of which we're going to return a motion dot section. And that motion section is going to render our original component like this. Now I know this might be a bit confusing, but I hope everything will make sense really soon. So first let's go to our HOC, create a new index.js file, which is going to allow us to export our section wrapper. So let's say import section wrapper from section wrapper, and we can simply export 
that same section wrapper right here for easier imports later on. Now we can go back to our about and at the top, we can import section wrapper from dot dot slash HOC. Now, if we scroll down, let me show you how do you use higher order components in React. You can wrap your export default about with a section wrapper. So you can do section wrapper. First, you pass the component and then you pass the ID, which is about in this case. There we go. So as you can see, I'm going to even move this right here so you can see better section wrapper about about. Now, if we save this, nothing has happened yet. So what did we actually do? Why did we wrap that? Well, later on, we're going to wrap all of these sections. That's going to be the overview, the work experience, and so on. So once we apply something in the section wrapper, for example, a text of test that should appear somewhere right here, it's going to be applied all over the place, not just in this one section. Of course, we're not going to just apply a text of test. We're going to apply so much more. We're going to do a variance of stagger container, which is going to animate our section, first of all. Then initially, we're going to set it to hidden. And while in view, we want to set it to show. Then we want to fix the viewport. So first, we want to show it once only, and we want to animate it for the amount of 0.25 seconds. And we can give it some class names to make it move away from the left corner. So that's going to be class name. It's going to be dynamic styles dot padding max dash w dash seven XL MX dash auto relative and Z dash zero. If we now save this and reload the page, you can see how nicely these cards animate and they're no longer stuck to the left side of the screen. And still, if we click right here to scroll, it's not going to scroll. So what we can do is right above the component, we can create a span element that's going to have a class name equal to hash dash span. And it's going to have an ID of ID name. And then in here, we can just render an empty space that is end and BSP like this. So just some empty space. And now this ID name is going to get populated from the ID name that we passed right here. And if we reload the page and click this, it actually scrolls down. So we're scrolling to that invisible span section. And also all of these framer motion animations, such as if I scroll right here, notice how the section appeared. This is going to be applied to future sections by simply wrapping them in this higher order component, which was the primary reason why we did that in the first place. And with that said, our hero section is now done as well as our overview. Now we're moving to our experience section, which is going to look like this. Great. So to do that, we can close the about, we can control click into experience, and we can get started. To get started with the experience section, we can first import a couple of things we're going to use. That's going to be vertical timeline, as well as vertical timeline element coming from react dash vertical dash timeline dash component. We're going to also import motion coming from react dash motion. And for our vertical timeline to work, we also need to import react dash vertical dash timeline dash component forward slash style dot min dot CSS. That's going to allow us to have this great looking animated timeline. Let's also fix this to be framer motion and not react motion. And then below that we can import styles coming from dot dot slash styles, we can import experiences coming from dot dot slash constants, we can import the section wrapper, which we have created for the last section, 
And I told you we're going to reuse it for all upcoming sections. And we can import the text variant coming from dot dot slash utils forward slash motion. Great. Now we can get started with creating our experience section. First, we're going to wrap it in an empty React fragment like this. And then we're going to have a motion dot div. That motion div is going to have a variance equal to a function call of text variant like this. This is going to make our P tags inside of it animate. So it's going to be almost the same as introduction and overview. So we can go back to about, we can open that component, and then we can copy these two, P and H2. And we can paste them right here instead of the motion div. But now it's not going to say introduction, it's going to say what I have done so far. And then instead of overview, we can say work experience. And if we save that, you can see this great section. As you can see, this is going to the left edge of the screen as well. But now you should already know what to do. The only thing we have to do is wrap the experience into the section wrapper higher order component that we have already created and give it an ID of work. As soon as we do that, it should move to the right side. So if we reload the screen, there we go. It's going to animate and it's going to be centered in the middle. Wonderful. Now we can proceed with our vertical timeline. So below our motion div, we can create another div and that div is going to have a class name equal to MT-20 flex and flex dash call. And finally, we can make use of that vertical timeline. If we save that, it's just going to be a line. So what we have to do is loop over the experiences by saying experiences.map, we get an experience and an index. And then for each one of these, we want to return an experience card, which is going to be a self-closing component to which we can pass a key equal to index and we can pass experience equal to experience, just like so. Also, we have to add one more closing parenthesis. There we go. So now it's going to break because the experience card is not yet defined. So we can scroll up and we can create a new component right here. Const experience card is equal to a react arrow function where we get experience as the first and only prop. If we save that, the error gets fixed, but we still cannot see anything here. So here we can use the vertical timeline element like this. To that element, we can apply a content style equal to background of hash 1D1836. And we can also apply a color of hash FFF. If we do that, again, still nothing changes. And that's because we don't have any content within it. So right here, if we render maybe experience and then dot, let's do date, we still cannot see anything there. So let's continue applying some additional styles right here. Let's give it a content arrow style equal to border right off seven pixels solid hash two, three, two, six, three, one. Let's add a date equal to experience dot date. Let's add an icon style equal to an object where we have the background set to experience dot icon BG. And if we save this and reload the page, I would hope something is going to appear by now, but still nothing is there. I guess it depends on this vertical timeline element, but I guess it does make sense because we just listed the icon style, but now we can list the actual icon. So the icon is going to be a div and within it, we're going to have a self-closing image tag with a source equal to experience dot icon. And alt is going to be experience dot company underscore name. And we can give it a class name equal to W dash 60% H dash 60% and object dash contain. Now, if we save this again, unfortunately, still nothing is showing. 
And I'm guessing that's because this vertical timeline element expects to have something within it. So that's why it doesn't have anything yet. But that's okay, we can proceed styling this icon. So before we finalize styling this icon, let's go into the contents of the actual timeline element. That's going to be a div. And within that div, we're gonna have an h3. That h3 is going to render experience.title. And of course, we have to give it a class name equal to text-white, text-24 pixels, as well as font-bold. And now if we save it, I was really hoping to see it in there, but it's possible we're rendering something in the wrong way. So let's go back up. And inside of here, yes, we are rendering this in the wrong way. So this is an arrow function, but in here it's expecting a return statement because we have wrapped it with curly braces. So if we replace this curly brace with a parenthesis, that means that we have an instant return. So this time we'll actually be returning something. And there we go, this is so much better. So let's just go one step back and let's comment out all of these things so you can see how it looks like if we start adding thing by thing. The vertical timeline by itself creates this structure where you have this div and then you have the icon. So we can bring back the content arrow style, the actual date experience, icon style and the icon. And there we go, this is already looking much better. So now we can also finalize styling the icon by changing the class name of this div to flex, justify center, items-center, w-full and h-full, which is going to center our icon. Great. Now we have the really base bare bones experience section, but of course we want to add some bullet points to emphasize what we did while working in that specific company. And we also want to list the company name. So now below this div containing the H3, we can also add a P tag. So that's just below the H3. And that P tag is going to render the experience dot company underscore name like this. Starbucks, Tesla, Shopify, Meta, great. Let's also style it a bit by providing a class name equal to text dash secondary, text dash 16 pixels to make it a bit larger and font semi bold. Great. Finally, we can give it a style equal to margin zero. Great. This is now looking great. And the last thing we need are the bullet points to indicate our experience. So below the div, we can create a UL, an unordered list give it a class name equal to MT-5 for margin top, list-disk, ML-5 for margin left, and then space-y-2 for spacing between the elements. In there, we can render the experience dot points dot map. We can map over each point and get the index. And for each point, we can return an LI that's going to have a key equal to experience dash point dash and then index. And finally, we can give it a class name equal to text dash white dash 100 text dash 14 pixels padding left dash one and then tracking dash wider. This is going to add some more letter spacing. Finally, inside of there, we can render each individual point. And just like that, you can see our experience section. Sometimes it's great to develop things on your own without using external libraries. But in this case, I really found this vertical timeline component handy as it provided exactly what I wanted. We have the timeline showing to where we were and where we are right now. So we're currently a full stack developer at Meta. We have the date and timeline and we also have the bullet points of what we did there. Great. So with that said, the work experience section is done as well. And we can move over back to app and then the text section awaits. The text section is quite an interesting one. In here, we're gonna explore how to create these 3D balls of actual technologies that we know and we have worked with before. 
as this is a 3D 3JS portfolio, we definitely wanted to include as many 3D elements as possible, and this is definitely one of them. So with that said, let's get started with the text section of our 3D portfolio. To get started with the text section, we'll first have to import a couple of things. And the most important one being our ball canvas coming from that slash canvas. That's going to be our actual balls. We can then import the section wrapper coming from dot dot slash HOC. And we can also import all of the technologies that we know coming from dot dot slash constants. And again, at any point in time, you can modify all of these technologies. So just so you know, now we also want to wrap this text section in the section wrapper, which we can do immediately. And this one doesn't have an ID. This div is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash row, flex dash wrap. So they fall into a new line. If the screen is too tight, justify dash center and gap dash 10 to give them some space to breathe. Inside of here, we want to loop over all of the technologies by saying technologies that map, we're going to get each individual technology. And then for each individual technology, we want to return a div. That div is going to have a class name equal to w-28 for width, as well as h-28 for height. It's also going to have a key equal to technology dot name. Finally, we want to render the ball canvas as a self closing component that's going to have an icon technology dot icon as its first and only parameter. And there we go. You can see about one, two, three, four, five, 10, 13 balls. Now to develop these balls using 3JS and React 3 Fiber, let's control click to go into the ball canvas and let's develop it from scratch. To do that, we can import something known as suspense coming from React. We're going to also need the canvas coming from React 3 Fiber, or that's going to be at React-3 forward slash Fiber. And we're going to need a lot of utilities from React 3 Dre. So that's going to be a decal, which we're going to use as the texture, float, orbit controls to be able to move it around, preload, and then use texture. And all of that is coming from add react dash three forward slash Dre. And finally, we need that canvas loader coming from dot dot slash loader. We created that before that is the one that loads the percentages. Finally, this ball is accepting some props. So we can define those props right here. And then we can first get the balls texture by saying const texture or rather const. And then we destructure the decal from, or rather is equal to use texture. And then what we pass to it, that's going to be props dot IMG URL. So where is this coming from? So we're calling this ball and that's technically a ball canvas and we're passing the icon technology dot icon. And that's coming from technologies. So if you look at technologies, you can see that we have the name and also we have the icon and the actual texture is coming from Dre and this image URL are these exact icons that we saw right here. Great. With that said, before we continue creating our ball, we first need the canvas to show it on. So below the ball, we can create const ball canvas is equal to it's going to accept an icon and it's going to return a canvas that's going to look like this. That canvas is going to be almost exactly the same as the canvas we used before in our hero section. So let's go to hero computer canvas, and let's simply copy this entire canvas right here. Going back to the ball, we can now duplicate this canvas over here frame loop is going to be on demand. In this case, these are going to be simple. So we don't need any shadows. We don't need the camera here. And the GL is going to still preserve the drawing buffer. We're going to have the suspense falling back to the canvas loader for that nice loading. And the orbit controls are also going to be simpler. We're simply going to say enable zoom is going to be set to false. 
Finally, we don't render computers. What we do render are bolts. So we can say bowl to which we're going to pass the image URL is equal to the icon. And that is it. That is our bowl canvas, which we need to export at the bottom. This is really important. So we're exporting the bowl canvas, not the actual bowl. Finally, if we scroll up, now we are turning a bowl right here, and we should be able to see it. So this bowl is actually going to float. So there's a special float property coming from React 3 Dre. And as soon as we do float, we might already see something. Let's see. It's really dark, so we cannot see it yet. So inside of this float, we're going to add some ambient light. So we can say ambient light, and we can give it intensity of 0 0.25. The float itself is going to have the speed equal to 1.75. We'll be able to play with that later. And it's going to have a rotation intensity of one, as well as the float intensity of two. These are just some properties that I found to work the best with our bolts. Great. Now we're going to also have a directional light right here. So directional light, and we're going to give it a position equal to an array of 0, 0, 0 0.05. Still, we cannot see anything because we don't have the mesh. But now we're going to create that mesh inside of which we're going to show everything. This mesh will cast a shadow. And it will also receive a shadow. So these are some special properties that we have. And the scale of the mesh is going to be 2.75. Inside of the mesh, we can render icosahedron geometry. To be honest, I don't know what icosahedron is, but some math geniuses can surely let me know that one in the comments. And we're going to pass the args equal to an array of one and one. And of course, we have to close that icosahedron. And there we go. Oh, I guess that's what icosahedron is. Okay, this is already looking great. We can play with them, we can float them, they float around, they have some gap in between. Looking great, if I can say so myself. Now, they don't have any material. So let's add mesh standard material and self close it. Already, this is going to have a really cool effect. But we can also apply a couple of props to it. We can give it a color equal to hash FFF8EB. We can give it a polygon offset. We can give it a polygon offset factor of minus five. And we could give it flat shading. Okay, this is looking just a bit better already. And finally, we need the texture, which is going to be this decal we had before. So let's create a new decal property. It's going to be self closing. It's going to have a map equal to decal that we created at the top. Now we cannot see it yet. But if we give it a position of an array of 0, 0, 1, you can already start seeing some shapes. And I guess I rotated these too far. So we cannot see it. So let me reload the page. And there we go. This is already looking so much better. Let's also give it a rotation equal to an array of two times math.py 0 and then 6.25. Because you can notice they're now horizontally mirrored. So we want to mirror them one more time. And now they look good. So that is two times math.py. And we can give them flat shading. Okay, this is already looking better. Our bowls are now done. We have our bowl, we have our bowl canvas, the technologies you know are being displayed right here. And that is looking great. Once again, if you want to change some technologies, you can simply go into the constants technologies, and then add them right here. Alongside the name, well, you'll also have to add the icon for that specific technology, which you can find online, and you can import right inside of here from assets. Great work, the balls are now done, which means that the text section is done. And we are ready to move to the work section, which is going to look like this. It's going to say my work projects. And then we will be able to have these wonderful cards with thumbnails that will showcase your most recent projects. Great. With that said, let's start with the work section.
To get started with our work section, we can first import a couple of packages we'll be using. One of them is tilt coming from that's going to be react dash tilt. We used this one before once we were working with these cards on top. Remember, we want to hover over them and then they tilt. So we're going to use this as well for these cards at the bottom for our project cards. So we can import tilt. We're going to also import motion coming from framer dash motion. Finally, we can get these styles coming from dot dot slash styles. And we can also import some assets. Primarily, we're just going to use one asset, which is GitHub coming from dot dot slash assets. We're going to also import our section wrapper coming from dot dot slash HOC. We're going to also import our projects which are coming from dot dot slash constants. So this is the actual data about the projects that we have created. And then finally, we can import some motion utility functions, such as fade in and text variant that are coming from dot dot slash utils forward slash motion. And now we have everything. Let's immediately dive into the JSX by wrapping everything into an empty React fragment. The reason why we're wrapping it in a fragment is because we're going to wrap it into a section wrapper right here that's going to have a div. So we can just leave it like this. There we go. And if you scroll down, there we go. We have an empty section. Now we can create a motion dot div. And this is going to be the same one we used right here. What have I done? work experience. So let's go back to the app. Let's go to experience. And let's grab this motion div right here containing the P tag and the H2 tag. We can go back to works and simply paste it right here. Now instead of what have I done so far, we're going to say my work or my projects. And then right here on H2, we can say projects dot. So if we scroll down now, it's going to look like this. Now we need to reload the page for the changes of the section wrapper to take effect. There we go. Now it's nicely centered. And then we can dive into the div below this motion div. This div is going to have a class name equal to w full for full width and flex. And then within that, we can create a new motion dot p. That motion is going to have a variant or variants equal to fade in. And it's going to not have any direction. It's not going to have any type, but it's going to have a delay of 0.1 seconds and a duration of one second. And we can also give it some class names, such as MT dash three margin top text dash secondary for the color text dash 17 pixels for the size max dash W dash three XL to make it readable on larger devices and leading dash 30 pixels to change the line height. And inside of here, we can have a description for our projects. I'm going to simply paste this paragraph that I wrote before following projects, showcase my skills and experience the real world examples of my work. Each project is briefly described with links to the code repositories and live demos in it. Feel free to change this however you want, or you can just copy it and then paste it right here. So let me reload the page. And there we go. You can see the description. Feel free to write something about your own projects right here. And of course, the most important part below this div right here, we're going to create one more div that's going to act as a wrapper for our project cards. So we can create a class name equal to MT 20 for margin top flex flex dash wrap because our cards are going to wrap if the screen size decreases and then gap dash seven to create some space. Inside of there, we want to loop over all of our projects. So projects.map, we get each individual projects and its index. And for each project, we want to return a component that we are yet to create called project card. Our project card is going to have a key equal to project dash and then the index. And there's also something else we need to pass to it. And by something else, I mean something really important. And that something is, of course, going to be the entire project. So we can spread out all of the properties of that specific project. 
and we can also pass the index equal to index. Now our project component or project card has everything we need, so we can declare it right here on top of the works. That's going to be const project card, like this, an arrow function. And we already know we're getting a lot of things through our props. But just to be sure, let's visit our constants and our project to see what does each project have. It has a name, a description, tags, name, color, image, and then the source code link. So I just want to point your attention to this. Feel free to change all of these project descriptions, values, names, and links. Everything is completely modifiable. Now let's make use of those props. We're getting an index. We're getting the name, description, tags, image, and source code link. Great. Now in here, we can return and we can wrap everything in a motion.div. And finally, we can say test inside of there for now, just to be able to see our three projects. Now this motion div is going to have variants and that's going to be equal to fade in. We want to fade them in up and we want to fade them in as a spring. That's the type of animation. Then we want to fade them in one by one. So we can say index time 0 0.5. So they're going to come one by one because the index for each consecutive one is going to increase. And then the actual duration is going to be 0 0.75 seconds. So now if we save this, and reload, you can see how one, two, three, they're coming one by one. Great. This is going to look even better once we have our actual cards. So let's create them. We're going to wrap everything in a tilt component. And to that tilt, we can provide some additional options. That's going to be a max property of 45, a scale property of one, and a speed property of 450. These are all settings for that tilt that I showed you earlier. And finally, we need to give it a class name. The class name is going to be BG tertiary. We're also going to P 5 rounded 2XL on small devices W 360 pixels. So we want to change this to 60 and W full. Now, if we save this, you should be able to see three really dark cards, which now even tilt already but let's make them look a bit better. So inside of this tilt, we can create a new div. That div is going to have a class name equal to relative w full, and then h 230 pixels. That's already going to give them some height. And right now we have one by one, all of them appearing in one column because we don't have a lot of horizontal space. But since we use flex wrap, if we were to increase the screen size, they would nicely fall into place. For now, we can keep them in one line. Great. Now let's see what else can we do to make this look even better. And of course, that's to display a self-closing project image. Let's give it a source equal to image, an alt equal to name, and of course, a class name equal to w-full, h-full, object-cover, and the rounded dash to Excel to provide some rounded corners. Okay, this is already looking so much better. You can see how that react tilt component really makes this come alive. If you haven't changed the values and the images so far from the constants, that's fine. You can keep using these ones. I'm going to explain the project later on. And then at the end, once this is developed, you'll be able to change this data to your own projects. Now below this image, we can create another div. That div is going to have a class name is equal to absolute. So we want to make something appear on top of the image. We're going to set the inset to zero flex justify dash end margin dash three and card dash IMG underscore hover. And inside of there, we're going to show that GitHub icon. So if you remember correctly, we want to show this little thing on top, right? So to achieve that, we can create one more inner div. And that div is going to have an on click property. There, we want to have a callback function that's going to call window.open. And then we want to do source code link and then underscore blank. So this is going to open that page in a new link. We also want to give it a class name, black 
dash gradient, W dash 10 and H dash 10. So that's going to make this black gradient box appear on top, right? But of course, we want to make it into a circle. So we can use a handy tailwind utility function called rounded dash full. Let's make it flex, justify dash center, items dash center, and cursor dash pointer. All of these properties will now allow us to position the image nicely right there. So we can say image is a self closing tag, source is equal to GitHub, alt is equal to GitHub, and then class name is equal to w dash one over two, h dash one over two, and then object dash contain. As soon as you save this, we can see nice GitHub icon appear right here. If you already have deployed your projects, one additional cool thing is to simply add another div. And then this div can be for the live URL of the project, just something to keep in mind. Now below this image and below three more divs, we want to create an additional div. This div is going to be for the name and the description of our project. So let's create a div with a class name equal to MT dash five margin top to divide it from the image. There, we want to create an H3 that's going to render the name. And below that, we want to render a P tag that's going to show the description. If we save that, everything breaks. So let's try to reload it. And let's try to open the inspect element to see what went wrong. It looks like the above error occurred here. Description is not defined. So maybe I misspelled it and that indeed did happen. So we can properly spell description and we are good to go. So if you scroll down, now you can see car rent, job IT and trip guide with their corresponding descriptions. I'm going to share a bit more info on these interesting projects really soon. Once we complete the project cards. Now let's style the H3 a bit by giving it a class name equal to text-white, font-bold, and text-24 pixels. Okay, that's more like it. And let's also style the description by giving it a MT2 to divide it from the top, text-secondary to make it, of course, secondary next to the title. And then let's also change the text to 14 pixels. There we go. So this is now looking great. And finally, we want to apply some tags, some main technologies of each project. In this case, I decided to use them as hashtags. So what we can do is below this div, we can create another div. That div is going to have a class name of MT-4 to divide it from the description, flex, flex-wrap, and then gap-2 to provide some space. Inside of there, we can map over those tags by saying tags that map. We're going to get each individual tag. And for each one, we want to return a P tag. That P tag is going to have a key equal to that's simply going to be tag dot name. And it's also going to have a class name that's dynamic set to text dash 14 pixels, but then dynamically tag dot color. So we want to change the color of each tag. And then here we can say hashtag, and then render the tag dot name. Now, if we save this, you can see react MongoDB tailwind. For the second one, we have react rest API and SCSS. And for trip guide, we have Next.js, Superbase and CSS. Of course, you can change all of these if you go into the project within the constants file. You can change the description, the name, as well as the source code link and the image. Great. With that said, now we have created a lot of sections. So let's expand our browser to see it in its full glory. There we go. As you can see, we have our great project section and all of the three projects appear in one line. We can hover over them. We can go to their source code. We can read the title, description, and the technologies looking great. Now, while we're here, let me tell you a bit about these projects in specific. Car Rent, a web-based platform that allows users to search, book, and manage car rentals. Jobit, a web application that enables users to search for job openings, view estimated salary ranges for positions, and locate available jobs based on their current location. 
and most importantly, TripGuide, a comprehensive travel booking platform. These three applications have been built by people just like you, learning web development inside of our JSM Masterclass experience. A bootcamp that helps you land your dream job within six months by support from myself and other mentors, or you get your money back. And yeah, I mean this. We created the Masterclass experience to help you get unstuck, to help you get away from learning just from YouTube tutorials and start focusing on what really matters, which is practical build experience. These projects that I've just showed you, such as Job Finder, that has a really comprehensive design for finding jobs, the travel and booking platform that is a comprehensive booking.com clone, and even the car rent application, which is a comprehensive car renting applications. Myself and other mentors help people just like you improve their web development skills throughout six months in the JSM Masterclass experience. So if you want to step up your game from just watching these YouTube videos into something more comprehensive and something that will take you way further in way less time, you can sign up right now by going down into the description and clicking the JS Mastery Pro link. I'll see you there. With that said, we can now proceed with the next section of our portfolio, which are the testimonials. So let's go ahead and go back to our own portfolio, collapse it all the way so we can see the code and scroll down. Now we're going to focus on the feedback section. So let's close the works and the index and let's open up feedbacks. Inside of the feedbacks, we are going to import motion coming from Framer Motion. We're going to also import the styles coming from dot dot slash styles. We can divide it as this is an internal import. We can also import the famous section wrapper coming from dot dot slash HOC. We can then import the fade in as well as the text variant, which are motion helpers. So they're going to come from dot dot slash utils forward slash motion. And finally, we can import the data for testimonials coming from dot dot slash constants. Once again, you can change these by going here, and then you can make these appear from the people that you actually know and you have worked with. Great. With that said, we can now start creating the layout of our feedback. So we can wrap it in a div that's going to have a class name equal to MT-12, BG black 100, and then rounded 20 pixels. Of course, this has to be within the square brackets. Now, if we save this, you cannot see anything yet because it's dark. So what we can do is we can create one more inner div that's going to have a dynamic class name. So it's going to be inside of curly braces and it's going to have styles dot padding. It's also going to have a BG dash tertiary. It's going to have a rounded dash two XL and it's going to have a min dash H dash 300 pixels. Now we can see this card right here, although it's really dark as well, but we're going to put some cards to contrast that darkness. So we can create a new motion div like this. That's going to have a variance property equal to text variant, and we can call it as a function. And then within there, we can do the same thing that we have done before. We're going to create a P tag that's going to say what others say. And then below that, we're going to create a new H2 tag that's going to say testimonials. And then add a dot at the end. Now let's style these a bit by giving it a class name equal to dynamically styles dot section sub text, not a head text. This is going to be a subtext. And then we can copy this entire thing the class name, and then paste it for the H2, but this is going to be a head text. If we save that, this is already looking much better. Now below this motion div and below one more div, we can create another wrapper div. This div is also going to have a dynamic class name, so we can do it like this. It's going to have a styles dot padding X, meaning horizontal. It's going to have a minus MT minus 20. 
Y minus, you're gonna see soon. Then it's going to have a padding bottom of 14, flex, flex dash wrap, and then gap dash seven. We cannot see anything yet because we are yet to create those testimonial cards. So inside of here, let's loop over our testimonials and notice how we have the similar pattern every time. We have the subtext, the head text, same thing right here, and then we have some cards to showcase what we do. Sometimes in web development and web design, people try to overdo it, but you always ought to follow a specific structure. We have a text, we have a description, and then we have something we do. Same thing right here. Don't put a lot of colors, a lot of fonts, a lot of differences on the website. Try to keep it consistent, but still interesting. That's exactly what we're doing with this portfolio. So let's map over our testimonials by doing testimonials.map. We're gonna get each individual testimonial and an index right here. And then we wanna return a feedback card for each one of these. A feedback card is going to have a key equal to testimonial dot name because each one is unique. It's going to have an index. And then finally, we have to spread the entirety of the testimonial properties. So let's see what each testimonial will have. It will have the testimonial itself, the name, the designation, the company, and the image. And of course, now we have to create this feedback card right here on top. So let's say const feedback card is equal to a React functional component with an instant return. And we already know that we're gonna get some props. So that's going to be index, testimonial, name, designation, company, and image. And finally, we can return a motion.div for each one of these cards. So now we can scroll all the way down and we cannot see anything yet. But if we just, for example, return something like the actual P tag, that's going to say testimonial and save it, we can already see three different pieces of text, which is good, but let's style them a bit. Let's apply some variants as well. So we can do variance is equal to fade in. We wanna just leave the direction empty, provide a spring type of the fade in, and then we wanna do index times 0 0.5, so every one is going to appear after the other one, and then we wanna do 0 0.75 for the duration. Great. Now let's also apply some class names to this motion div. So that's going to be class name bg-black-200, padding-10, rounded-3xl to make it a bit rounded. On extra small devices, the width is going to be 320 pixels and usually it's going to be full width. There we go. Now we have actual divs that contain the testimonial. Now we wanna add this cool little quote sign at the top. So let's do that first. We're gonna create a new P tag inside of that motion div, and we're gonna put one single quote. But of course we have to style it a bit by giving it a class name equal to text-white, font-black, text-48 pixels. So that's going to be huge. And there we go. If I fix the typing error, there we go. This is already looking better. Now we're gonna have a div for the rest of the content. So we can create a new div that's going to have a class name equal to MT1 to divide from the top. And then we can put this testimonial right here within that div. So that's going to look like this. Below the testimonial, we can have another div that's going to act as the wrapper for the rest of the content. So that div is going to have a class name equal to MT-7 flex justify dash between items dash center and gap dash one. So what we're doing is we're creating this piece right here, the div that's going to contain the name, the at sign, the position, and then finally the image of the person leaving the review. So within this div, we can create one more div. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex dash one, flex, and then flex dash call. Within there, we wanna have a P tag. And within that P tag, we wanna have a span. That span is going to render the at sign 
and outside of the span, we want to render the name at Sarah Lee. Great. And finally, below that P tag, we can create another P tag that's going to say designation of company. So who and at what company? CFO of Acme Co, CEO of Dev Corp, and so on. Great. Now, of course, we can style this a bit. Let's start with styling the actual testimonial by giving it a class name equal to text-white, tracking-wider, and text-18 pixels. So that's going to look like this, a bit larger, a bit more pronounced. Then we want to style this P tag by giving it a class name equal to text-white, font-medium, and text-16 pixels. Okay, that made it a bit more pronounced as well. Let's change the span by giving it a class name equal to blue-text-gradient. Okay, so now we have this blue at sign. And finally, let's apply class names to the bottom P tag. That's going to be MT-1, text-secondary, and text-12 pixels. There we go, Sarah Lee, but now the position in the company is a bit less pronounced. The most important and the biggest thing, of course, is the actual testimonials, what they have to say about you. And now below this div right here, let's also display an image of that person leaving the testimonial. So that's going to be the source equal to image. The alt tag equal to, let's do something dynamic like feedback by, and then we can leave the name right here. Okay. And finally, a class name of W-10, H-10, rounded-full to make it a circle, and object-cover. And there we have our image looking great. With that said, if we now expand our testimonials, and I can just see right now that I wrote testimonials, so let's fix that right here. That's going to be here, testimonials. That's a bit better. Let's expand it. Okay, and can you notice the issue? It's appearing at the left side, but you already know how to fix that. We simply have to wrap it with a section wrapper. I'm glad I missed that because now you can see the importance of higher order components and how simply they fix the issues that we would have to now write a lot of code for. There we go. This is so much better. So we have this testimonials, and I promised I'm gonna explain what that minus MT does, minus margin top. Well, you can see it makes these cards go over to this div right here, which gives it a really cool effect. Great. So now we have the projects, we have the testimonials. What else could people ask for? They know who we are, they know what we do, they know what we are about. Well, of course, now that they know all of that, they wanna get in touch with us. So we're gonna create this really cool 3D form with 3D stars flowing in the back and then this planet to denote that they can reach out to us wherever they're from. Really cool. So let's get started with this really unique contact section by closing the feedbacks and then moving to contact. To get started with the contact section, we can first import a couple of things from React and this time that's going to be the use state as well as use ref hooks coming from React. Then we're gonna also import motion coming from Framer Motion. And this time we're gonna also import something new. We're gonna import email.js coming from add email.js forward slash browser. This is a tool we'll use to add the functionality to our contact form so people can send us emails. Finally, let's import the styles coming from dot dot slash styles. Let's import the earth canvas. This is an interesting one. So earth canvas coming from dot slash canvas. Let's import the section wrapper as we always do coming from dot dot slash HOC. And let's import a motion utility function called slide in coming from dot dot slash utils forward slash motion. Great. 
With that said, we can get started with our contact. And in this case, we first have to specify a use state field. So we can say use state. We're going to call it form, set form. And at the start, it's going to be equal to an object containing a name, containing the email address, and containing the message, which are all going to be set to an empty string. Finally, we'll also have to define an empty use ref. So that's going to be const form ref is equal to use ref. We're going to use this later on. Great. Also, when we're submitting the form, we want to show some kind of a loading. So we can create another use state called loading, set loading. And at the start, it's going to be set to false. Great. When it comes to the functionality, later on, we're going to create the handle change logic, and also the handle submit logic. So let's create just empty functions for now, handle change, handle submit, so we can reference them in our code later on. Great. With that said, we can start creating the layout of our contact form. So let's scroll all the way down. And as you can see, we have our contact right here. So let's wrap everything in a single div. That div is going to have a class name equal to on extra large devices, margin top is going to be 12. On extra large devices, also, we're going to have a flex row. And usually, we're going to have a flex dash column slash reverse, we're going to have a flex property, a gap of 10, as well as overflow dash hidden. So we're trying to ensure that we have everything we need to show this great contact form, as well as the earth here without any mistakes on mobile devices, and on larger devices too. Now let's also wrap this in a section wrapper, as we always do. So that's going to be the contact form. And this time, we're going to also give it an ID equal to contact so we can actually scroll through it. So now if we go all the way to the top of the website, and if you reload the page and click contact, it scrolls all the way down, which means that we are ready to start developing it. Now the form is also going to be animated, it's going to slide in from the left. So we can create a new motion dot div. This motion div is going to have a variance property as motion divs usually do. So it's going to be variance equal to slide in, we're going to call it as a function, and we want to slide in from the left side, while our earth object is going to fly in from the right side, then the type of the animation is going to be tween, it's going to be delayed 0.2 seconds, and it's going to have a duration of one. Finally, we also want to give this div a class name of flex dash 0.75. 75, meaning we wanted to take three fourths of the screen, we want to change the BG black to 100, which is the color, a big padding of eight, and we want to make it a bit rounded. So 2XL. If we save this, we cannot see anything yet. But we're now creating the basis of our future div. Inside of there, we can create a P tag, that's going to say get in touch. And below that P tag, we can create an H3 property that's going to say contact with a dot. Great. And we still cannot see those. So let's apply some class names. The P tag is going to have a dynamic styles dot section sub text. And then the H3 is going to have a class name equal to styles dot section head text. And then if we save this and reload the page, we can see how get in touch and contact slide in from the left side. Looking great. Now immediately below the h three, we're going to start creating our form. So our form is going to have a ref equal to form ref, the one we initialized at the top. It's also going to have an on submit property, which is going to be equal to the handle submit function, for now an empty function, which we're going to fill in later on. And then it's going to have a class name equal to margin top 12, flex, flex dash call, and then gap dash eight. For now, that's not going to do anything. But soon enough, we're going to create the inputs for this form. So you'll be able to see it. So let's start with first one of these, that's going to be a labeled property. That label is going to have a class name equal to flex, 
and flex dash column so we can make multiple elements appear one beneath another. The label is going to have a span that's going to say your name. And that span is going to have a class name equal to text dash white, font dash medium, and margin bottom all four. There we go, your name. And now is the time for us to create the input. So the input is going to be a self-closing tag that's going to have a type equal to text, a name equal to name, value equal to form dot name, on change equal to handle change. It's going to have a placeholder equal to what's your name. And it's going to have a class name equal to bg dash tertiary. Immediately you can see it right there. Then it's also going to have a padding Y of four to make it a bit taller and PX of six to make it a bit wider. It's going to have a placeholder color of text dash secondary. It's going to have a text dash white. It's going to be a bit rounded. So we're going to apply a rounded dash LG. It's going to have outline dash none because we don't like those ugly default CSS outlines. We also don't like default borders. So we're going to say border dash none, and we're going to change the font to medium. Now, if we save this, we have a great looking input, but we cannot yet type anything in it. We'll make that possible soon once we change the handle change function. For now, we simply need to duplicate this entire label and all of its contents two more times, one more time for the input, and then the last time for the message. There we go. Now let's change the second input just a bit. This is going to be instead of your name, we're going to say your email. Instead of type text, it's going to be type email. Name is going to be email as well. Value is going to be form that email. And then we're going to say what's your email. And everything else should remain the same. Now we can move to the last one. That's going to be your message what does somebody want to say to us. And instead of this being an input, it's going to be a text area with the rows property equal to seven. This means that we're going to provide people with some space to write the actual message. We don't need the type text on the text area. The name is going to be message. Value is going to be form that message. And then the placeholder is going to be what do you want to say? So what do you want to say? And I just noticed that in here, I said placeholder, and we want to change this to placeholder for this to appear. So let's bring this back all the way from dear to just the regular placeholder. And there we go. This is already looking so much better. And with that, we have created all of our inputs. So the only last missing piece of the puzzle is the actual button. So below the last label, we can create a button component. That button is going to be of a type is equal to submit. And there we want to check if we are currently loading. If we are, we can say something like sending dot dot dot. If not, it's just going to say send. So there we go. Here is our send button. Now let's style it a bit by giving it a class name equal to BG dash tertiary. Let's give it a PY of three. That's padding. Let's also give it a PX of eight. Let's give it the outline equal to none. W dash fit, text dash white, font dash bold, shadow dash MD to make it seem like a button, and then shadow dash primary. Okay, this is already looking much better. Let's also do rounded dash XL to have the rounded borders. And now let's compare this with the final version. Yep, that's looking good to me. You can see that we also have the stars floating in the back on the finished version. We're going to add that soon. For now, the form is looking great. Now, what do you say? Let's focus on the stars and on this great Earth model. And then once we do that, we can focus on the email functionality. So for now, before adding the stars, let's just add the floating Earth model right here below the form. So we're going to exit this motion div, and we're going to enter a new motion dot div. This div is going to have a variance property. And it's going to be very similar 
to the one that we had in our first motion div. So we can copy this variance and we can go down and we can paste it right here. There's going to be one difference though. Can you notice it? Let me just expand our browser, go to the finished version and reload. Can you see the difference? The contact model comes from the left side and then the earth model comes from the right side. So we want to change this to slide in from the right. Great. Now going back to our own website, scrolling down, we can now also apply a class name to this motion div. On extra large devices, the flex is going to be one because both the model and the contact form are going to take one space. Then we also want to change the extra large devices height to auto. Usually on medium devices, height is going to be 550 pixels. And then usually the height is going to be 350 pixels like this. So we're just changing the size of the canvas on which the earth will be displayed right here. Finally, and most importantly, we want to show the earth canvas right here inside of this motion div. So of course, to develop it, we can reload the page. The earth flows in from the right, but right now the earth is just a piece of text that says earth. So let's dive into the earth canvas and let's load this magnificent earth model. We can do that, of course, by importing something known as suspense coming from React. But even more importantly, we need to import Canvas. As we learned before in 3JS, everything 3D related appears on a Canvas. And that's coming from React 3 Fiber. Then we also learned that we can get a lot of these utility functions, such as Orbit Controls, Preload, and the Use GLTF that are coming from React 3 Tray. That's a helper library. And finally, we can import our canvas loader coming from, that's going to be dot dot slash loader. Okay, and we are ready to start creating that ERT canvas. Now we're gonna have the ERT model, which we can leave as it is for now, and we can create a new one below that's going to be const earth canvas. Great. Now inside of there, we want to return the canvas. The canvas is not a self-closing component. And let's apply a couple of props to it. Now this model will have shadows, which is cool. The frame loop is going to be set to demand. Then we want to get that GL property that's going to be equal to preserve drawing buffer to true, like we had it before. And then we can change the camera position. For now, we can leave this as an empty object. We're gonna modify it as soon as we import that great model. Finally, we wanna add React Suspense to this. Suspense is going to ensure that while our model is loading, we have something to show. So we're gonna apply a fallback that's going to render the canvas loader component if our model hasn't yet loaded. In other case, if it has loaded, we're gonna render the orbit controls, which are going to allow us to modify and move around the earth with our mouse like this. And we wanna specify some options to those orbit controls. We're gonna say auto rotate is going to be set to true. Enable zoom is going to be set to false. And then we can do the same thing with it to our PC on top. We can apply a max polar angle. That's going to be math.pi over two and then we can do the min polar angle as well. Great, this is just how the rotation is happening. Finally, and most importantly, we can render the earth model right here, which for now again is just earth. And at the end of the day, we want to return the earth canvas and not the actual earth model. So that's what we're doing right here. Now we are importing the earth right here but we haven't yet imported the earth model. Right now, it is just a text that says earth. So we already learned how to import great 3D models. And that is like this. Const earth is equal to use GLTF hook to which we can pass the path to our 3D model. That's going to be planet forward slash scene dot GLTF. So you just need that GLTF file. 
and of course something might break, but no worries, that's fine. I just want to point out that these models are within the public folder right here, planet, and then scene.gltf. Again, as I mentioned before, if you wanna get some other models, you can just simply Google for 3D models online and then find the gltf file, put it here, and then reference it right here. Great, now we want to return a primitive as we learned before. And that primitive is going to be a self-closing tag that most importantly has the object, which is equal to earth.scene. Now, if we scroll all the way down, we should be able to see a really small earth right here. So what do you say? Let's make it a bit bigger by changing the scale to 2.5. That's more like it. Let's change the position dash Y to be equal to zero. And also the rotation dash Y to be zero as well. This is just going to ensure that we can rotate it horizontally. And with that, we also wanna apply some additional properties to our camera. So our camera can have an FOV, a field of view equal to 45. Let's check out what that does. Now, if you reload the page, it's going to make it much, much, much larger. Let's also change the near to 0.1. Let's change the far to 200. And let's change the position just a bit to that's going to be an array of minus four, three, and six. I found these values to work the best. Now, if we save this and reload the page, we can scroll up a bit and you can see we have this wonderful earth model in its best possible form. Also due to the flex properties we used, if we expand this, it's going to show nicely like this. We can reload the page and there we go. This is looking wonderful. Now, the only part we're missing, of course, are the stars. Stars make it just look so much better because it seems like the earth is flowing in space. And in here, it doesn't really seem that way. So that's a nice little detail we decided to add just for you to make your portfolio even better. If you appreciate that, feel free to leave a like, comment down below that you like the stars, and let me know what would you like to see in the next video. With that said, we're now done with this Earth model and we can exit it. And we're also done with the contact section besides the functionality, which we're gonna do soon. But for now, we can go back to the app and we can go into the stars canvas right here. To implement our stars, it's going to be a similar procedure as working with our other 3D elements. We'll have to import some things from React 3 Fiber and React 3 Dre, but this time we'll be working with math as well as all of these particles will be created by us, you'll be able to define the density of the particles flowing in the air. With that said, let's get started with adding those stars to our portfolio. We can start by importing a couple of things from React. By a couple of things, I mean use state, use ref, as well as suspense. And that's coming from React. We're then gonna import the canvas, but this time the use frame as well, coming from add react-3 forward slash fiber. We're gonna also import something known as points, point material, and preload coming from add react-3 forward slash dre. Finally, we're gonna import everything as random coming from M-A-A-T-H forward slash random forward slash dist forward slash M-A-A-T-H dash random dot E-S-M. So this is that special math utility that we imported before. Finally, we can create our stars, which are gonna accept some props, but we can also create our stars canvas. So that's going to be const stars canvas looking like this. And that's the thing that we actually want to export later on. So our stars canvas is going to simply return a div. That div is going to have a class name equal to w-full, h-full. It's going to be absolute because it's going to show behind the actual earth and the contact form. Inset dash zero. And then we're gonna set the z index to minus one. That way it's going to show behind those elements. 
immediately inside of the div, we want to render the canvas element. Inside of the canvas, we can change the camera position to be equal to an array of 0, 0, 1. I found this value to work the best. There, as always, we can have a suspense that's going to have a fallback to null this time because it can load really quickly. And then we're going to render our stars model. And at the bottom of the suspense, we're going to add a preload component as well, where we can say all. Great. This is our stars canvas, but now we have to develop the actual stars, which we're going to create from scratch. So first of all, let's initialize an empty ref by saying const ref is equal to use ref. After the ref, we can start focusing on the layout. So in this case, we won't have the mesh, but we're going to have the group. And within that group, we're going to have a lot of points. So we can say points with the ref is equal to ref. And then we have to give it a position. So positions of those spheres. So we can say positions is equal to sphere. And now we need to define that sphere. So we can say const sphere is equal to that's going to be random dot in sphere. And we want to add new float 32 array. And let's make it 5000. So 5000 particles, we can add a comma, and then say radius is equal to or colon 1.2. So now we have our sphere. We also want to add a stride stride like this is equal to three. And if you want to learn more about what these properties do, just go to 3JS or React 3 Fiber documentation and you can type stride there. There's also this property called Frustum Cooled. And to be fully honest, I'm not sure what it does. It says right here, when this is said, it checks every frame if the object is in the Frustum of the camera before rendering the object. Okay, just something to keep in mind. And finally, we can spread all of the props right here to those points. Now, if we save this, most likely something is going to break, which is fine. That's because the points are not going to be a self closing component, we want to have something in there. So within those points, we need to specify the point material. This is going to be made out of star dust. Um, I'm just joking, but these will be stars. So we're going to make them transparent. We're also going to change the color to be set to a string of hash f 272 c 8 Let's give it a size of 0 0.002, really small. There is the size attenuation property, which we're going to set to true. And there's the depth right, which we're going to set to false. And if we save this and reload the page, we can now scroll down. And there's still nothing happening, but no worries, we're going to get to that really soon. Our stars need to rotate. And instead of rotating every single star, we're going to rotate the entire group. So we can say rotation. And then we're going to set that to an array of zero, zero, and then math that pi over four, like this. And we can save that. In math, just m is going to be uppercase. And if you scroll down, we still cannot see anything. Even after adding the rotation, we still cannot see the stars. So let's see if everything is all right with our stars canvas. Right here, I can see that I specified the h full, but we should have specified h auto. That's just one little fix that we can make. And right here, I can notice that I misspelled absolute. So if we fix this, there we go. Our particles just showed, but they're not moving around. So we can scroll up and now we can make them rotate. We can do that by using a special utility coming from React 3 Fiber called use frame. So we can call this use frame as a hook, pass in the state and something known as a delta, meaning a change. And then we can say ref that current dot rotation dot x minus equal to delta divided by 10. And then we can repeat this for the y as well and make this 15. Now, if we save this, you can see that the stars will start moving. Is this not crazy? We have implemented the stars, we added the rotation, and we also use this crazy use frame feature, 
which allows us to rotate something frame by frame. And in this case, we're changing the rotation of the stars, meaning we're making them move and float in the space. And with these stars floating at one specific speed and the planet moving at a different speed, it really does look like it's flowing in space. With that said, we can close the stars and we can expand our browser to admire this in its full glory. I'm going to reload the page and scroll down. And would you look at that? We have the contact form. The stars are right here. Everything is looking great from the start of the portfolio to the end. And these stars just make it as a nice finisher. Meaning once somebody reads everything about us, they are greeted by the stars and they are ready to contact us right here to let us know that we got the job. So with that said, our application is now complete. The last thing we have to do is go back into the contact section and we have to implement the actual functionality. Now that we have everything right here, that's going to be pretty simple. And again, we'll be using the email JS service to make this even simpler. Let's get started. First, we have to create an account on emailjs.com and it is as simple as pressing sign up free. Once you sign in, you'll see a dashboard that looks like this. And there's a quota of 200 free emails, which should be more than enough. One of these is surely going to get you a job. So let's go ahead and create a new service. Let's do Gmail. In here, you're going to get your service ID and you'll have to connect your account. So you can simply sign in with Google. And once you sign in and connect it, you can create the service. There we go. Now you can go to email templates and you can create a new template. You can leave everything as it is. It's going to work by default. So let's click save. And let's click OK. The template has been saved successfully. Great. So if we go back to email templates, now you have your template ID right here, which you can copy. And back in templates, we have our template ID. So you can click it, you can go to settings, and you can copy your template ID. For now, let's simply paste it right here on top of our contact as a comment. Then let's go back to our email services. And let's also go to Gmail and let's copy our service ID. We're going to need that as well. And finally, you can go to your name and then you can copy the public key. And you can paste that right here on top as well. We're going to use this really soon. With that said, we can go back to our contact JSX and we can start implementing the functionality starting with the handle change. Inside of the handle change, we get a key press event. And from that event, we can extract the target. So we can say target is equal to E like this. And what we can also do is we can also extract the name and the value immediately from E.target. So essentially we went two steps deep because e.target.name and e.target.value exist on this event property. Finally, once we get that, we can set the form to be equal to an object where we spread the entire form and then we update the name to the newly created value. What this will allow us to do is now we can actually update these fields and enter our name, our message and our email. Great. Now we can focus on the handle submit, which is the most important part. So once we start with the submit, we first want to prevent default. So we want to call e.preventDefault because otherwise the browser would refresh it as that is the default browser behavior. Then we want to start with the loading. So we want to start the sending of the email message. Then we want to call the email JS library and we want to call the dot send function. There we have to pass a couple of things. First one is the service ID, then the template ID, and then the public key. So we can pass those right here. Let's get them from the top. We took these just a couple of moments before from the email JS service. So first we have to pass the service ID, which is this one. You can just pass it as a string right here. The second one we have to pass is going to be the template ID. So you can copy it and paste it right here. Now let's paste this in a couple of lines. So it's going to be service template. Then as a third parameter, we have to provide an object with some options. So these options are going to be from underscore name. 
is equal to form.name. So we know who's sending it. Then we have two underscore name that's going to be your name. In my case, it's going to be Adrian. After that, we can enter the from underscore email, which is going to be equal to form.email. So we know who is sending it. After that, we're going to have two underscore email, which is going to be your email. In my case, contact at jsmastery.pro. You can enter your own email here. And finally, the message is going to be equal to form.message. That's all that we need to pass. Finally, the last variable, the fourth parameter, is going to be our public key. So we can copy that public key right here. There we go. Again, you get all of these values from your email JS. You can see where I copied them. I got the template from the templates, the service from the services, and then you get your usual key if you click on your name on the navbar of the email JS service. Great. Now we have everything we need right here. And the main question is what's going to happen when this actually executes? Well, we want to call a dot then function on it. That then is going to accept one callback function inside of it. And there we want to set the loading to be equal to false. We also want to add an alert that's going to say, thank you. I will get back to you as soon as possible. Great. And then finally, we want to reset the form. So that's going to be set form is going to be equal to an object where name is an empty string, email is an empty string, and the message is an empty string as well. Finally, after this function, we can provide another callback function called error. So we can set the loading to false in that case as well. And we can simply console log the error. And we can also alert something like something went wrong. There we go. Just so the user knows that they haven't sent you an email and they can find your email somewhere else. And believe it or not, that's it to allow us to send emails. So I'm going to enter my name. I'm going to enter my email. And I'm going to enter my message. And I'm going to click send. Sending. And thank you. I will get back to you as soon as possible. That means that everything went through. Isn't that great? And if you go back to your email provider, you should see something like this. You got a new message from Adrian. Hi there. This means that our email works. That is phenomenal. With that said, our contact session is done. And with it, our entire application. We came to the last component on this entire structure. That means that we can now expand our browser all the way to the end. We can scroll all the way to the top and we can reload the page to check it once again in its full glory. We can now also close the other deployed link because soon enough we're going to deploy this one ourselves. Okay, let's check it out. So once again, hi, I'm Adrian on top. We have this wonderful 3D model, which we haven't seen in quite some time because we spent some time developing the rest of the page. Now we have this automatic scroll, which brings us to the overview where we have the web developer, React Native developer, backend and content creator. Again, you can change every single little detail on this page by going into constants. You can change the experience to match your actual experience. In this case, we worked at Tesla, Shopify, uh, Meta as well. And then finally, we can see these balls with technologies that we know and we are proud of working with. That is great. Then we have some projects right here. Again, these are projects that the masterclass students have built. Maybe you can in the future too. But for now, you can put your own projects right here. Again, make sure that these are great projects that employers really want to see. Then we have the testimonials for people that put trust in you and that actually have something good to say about you. And finally, we have this wonderful 3D contact section looking great. And just to verify, let's ensure this is mobile responsive. So I'm going to go right here to mobile and I'm going to scroll all the way up one more time. Yep. This is looking good. Everything falls nicely in mobile view. Everything is readable. We can see the balls. We can see the projects. We can see testimonials and we can see the contact. This is wonderful. I love it. Hopefully you love it as well. This has been a phenomenal build. And as we always do on the JavaScript Mastery YouTube channel, now I'm going to show you how to deploy it 
to hosting your incredibly fast servers where you can put it on your own domain name to really make yourself stand out. You know, you don't wanna have that ugly URL where there's a ton of random characters. You wanna have something your first and last name.com. That's what you need. And that's what I showed you how to get at the beginning of this video. And now I'm gonna show you how to deploy it as well. So let's get started. And we are back on our Hostinger's dashboard. I already purchased the domain name at the start of the video. It's going to be jsmasterypro.com. Hopefully you purchased yours as well. If you haven't already, you can do that right now. The link is going to be down in the description. If you haven't yet connected the domain to the setup, the setup is going to be right here with a big yellow button. But if you already connected it, you can go to hosting and then you can go to the hosting connected that specific website and click manage. Right here, we have our file manager, which you can click and open. Here, you can enter the public underscore HTML folder and you can delete the default.php file because we're gonna replace it with our entire application. So back in our application, let's first close all of the currently open files, go to view and then terminal. Let's stop it from running by pressing control C and then let's run npm run build. This is going to create an optimized version of our application ready for production. This process usually takes about a minute, so let's leave it be and I'll be right back. Actually, we are using Vite, so this got completed in about 10 to 15 seconds. So you can go to Explorer and you can find your new dist folder right here. You can right click it and then click reveal in file explorer or find in finder. Once you've done that, you can enter the dist folder. You can drag and drop everything into the Hostinger's H panel. This is going to take a moment to upload your files and there we go. So we can close our H panel, go back to our dashboard and we can visit our domain. And as you can see, the website loaded. We have our Adrian portfolio right here on our own custom domain. Hopefully you got something that matches your first and last name. We have our wonderful 3D model, incredibly fast servers and an incredibly nice looking website. I'm really happy with all the animations, 3D models, but at the end of the day, I'm happy with the hosting, deployment, and the domain name as well. This is looking great. And once again, thank you so much for coming to the end of this video. And you should thank yourself for building such a phenomenal portfolio that's going to play a major role in helping you achieve developer greatness. As you can see, for me, the SSL certificate has been automatically installed. If that wasn't the case for you, you can go to security and then SSL and install it manually. But as you can see, the process is incredibly seamless. Everything works right off the bat, incredibly fast servers, SSL certificates, fast load times, all of the things that are definitely gonna make you stand out from the crowd, especially with this beautiful 3D, 3JS developer portfolio. With that said, I wanna thank you for coming to the end of this video. If you want some more in-depth coaching, feel free to check our courses right here on jsmastery.pro or if you want some deeper one-on-one -on -one mentoring with mentors, definitely check out our JSM Masterclass experience. I'll see you there, or I'll see you in the next video. In any case, have a wonderful day.